to the Inter-American Dialogue, and uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have all of you with us today to uh, discuss a, uh, a critical topic um, throughout the Americas and indeed throughout the world, um, the fight against uh, corruption. And I want to welcome um, the partnership that we have with Transparency International in this event. And Zoe Ryder is uh, here at the front row. And thank you for your collaboration and <laughs> cooperation. And the dialogue is extremely happy to be working with Transparency International, uh, not only on this event, but on, uh, on the broader issue of uh, fighting corruption uh, in Latin America. Uh, this is a topic that the dialogue has worked on since um, its founding some 35 years ago, uh, but we've given it renewed emphasis uh, and greater focus in the last couple of years when we established uh, a rule of law program, which is one of our highest priorities, uh, now led by Michael Camilleri, who's the program director, um, who unfortunately is in uh, Argentina today, not unfortunately for him necessarily, but he's, uh, he's in Argentina uh, today, and uh, I want to thank him for helping to make this event possible, uh, as well as thank uh, Ben Raderstaff, who is a program associate uh, in the Rule of Law program, uh, for pulling this event uh, together. Uh, the dialogue has, um, has had recent events um, in the last few months on Mexico, Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela, uh, other countries. Uh, we have an event next Tuesday on Brazil and the elections in Brazil. And in every event on any country, uh, the question of corruption uh, is uh, very much uh, prominent and salient in the discussions. And obviously, it's had serious repercussions throughout the region and continues to do so. Um, it's, a, it's a special um, personal pleasure today to welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue a good friend for several decades now, uh, Jose Ugas, who um, is now the chairman of Transparency International, a position that he's held since 2014, uh, which is, uh, of course, many of you know that, so that transparency is really at the fore of the fight against uh, corruption globally. Um, and there's no one better uh, to be with us and talk about what's happening um, and what we might expect um, in the coming period than Jose. He has a deep knowledge of uh, what's happening in, in many of the countries throughout the region and also brings a broad comparative perspective. Uh, we had a conversation in, in Lima just a few weeks ago. Uh, and we went through some of the, I think, main issues. And I said, well, uh, when you come to Washington, why don't you come by the dialogue and engage with the a policy community in Washington that has a strong interest? And he has uh, kindly agreed to come by today. Jose is a widely respected uh, lawyer and jurist. Uh, um, he was the ad hoc attorney for high profile corruption cases in Peru in the 1990s, and then uh, perhaps most notably uh, with President, uh, former President Fujimori and his intelligence chief, Vladimir Montesinos, uh, who are both now uh, in prison because of uh, corruption. Um, Jose has a law degree from the Catholic University, he did his postgraduate work at The Hague and Salamanca. Uh, he was the head of the uh, Peruvian chapter of Transparency it's called Proetica, uh, was also an Eisenhower Fellow and worked here at the World Bank in the Office of Institutional Integrity for several years. So he has a Washington base as well. Um, he is a, extremely uh, busy, has many obligations, so we're uh, grateful to him for taking some time out of his schedule to join us uh, today. Uh, we're going to have a, a conversation and Looking around this room, I see a lot of people that have uh, great knowledge and expertise uh, and interests. So we're going to leave a lot of time for a discussion and have an open forum and exchange on this issue. Um, and at the conclusion, we'll have uh, lunch available. Uh, I don't know if we'll have ceviche for you, Jose, <laughs> but uh, I hope uh, we'll, do, we'll do the best 
best we can. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. Let, let me just start, uh, if I could, with a little bit of your sense of um, you've been very, very involved in, on this issue for many, many years. And uh, the Peruvian case is, is very, very prominent and well known. And I was wondering if you could just give us a sense of what's different today. In other words, corruption is an old issue. It's been around for a long time. There's been corruption. We've had discussions about corruption. Uh, and, and, and of course, the Peruvian case was quite, quite dramatic and quite emblematic. But is this just another, uh, another example of a moment where there's some tension on corruption that will eventually pass? Or is there some, you sense there's, a, there's, a, there's a, something fundamentally different 2017 than there was in 2015 years ago, 20 years ago on this issue. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Good morning with everybody. Uh, this is a question we made to ourselves uh, four years ago when TI was uh, accomplishing 20 years of existence. And we were asking ourselves in a narcissist exercise if we had been successful or not. And uh, the conclusion was that we were successful in many things. We put the issue of corruption on the top of the agenda. We have contributed to the UNCAC and all the regional conventions against corruption. But at the same time, if we put our heads out of the window, we would see that there's too much corruption out there. So the, the question was not if we had failed or succeeded, but the question was, is this corruption the same corruption we had to confront 20 years ago. And after several exercises and workshops, uh, we've been really thinking on this. The conclusion is that the type of corruption we are confronting nowadays is different. It's totally different. It's a different animal than the one we confronted 20 years ago. And uh, in the process of this exercise, we arrived to the conclusion that this corruption that we are calling now grand corruption is not only different because of the amount of money that is involved and the resources, but because there's a quality, uh, very notable difference between grand corruption and what we would call regular corruption. Grand corruption has basically three elements. It's committed by very powerful authors or actors, politically or economically. So it could be on the private, on the public sector. It mobilizes huge amounts of resources and the most important of the elements probably is that this type of corruption has a tremendous impact in human rights. It's affecting the lives of people. Grand corruption kills, denies education, health, access to housing, uh, clean water, etc. Two additional features of this type of corruption usually travels through organized crime, and it remains impugned because of the power of the actors. In the past, Two decades, you can count with the fingers of one hand those cases of big corruption. It was Suharto in Indonesia, Abacha in Nigeria, Marcos in the Philippines, Dos Santos in Africa, maybe up to Fujimori. But nowadays, you put on the TV, you grab a newspaper, and every day we have huge cases of corruption affecting the people. Yanukovych in Ukraine, 7.5 billion. Uh, in Tunisia, Ben Ali, more than $8 billion. Recently in uh, Catalonia, Pujol, uh, they say that he had taken around 3 billion euros. Martinelli in Panama, I mean, Mubarak in Egypt, more than $20 billion. And you know, every day we have these type of stories and the results of this uh, on the most vulnerable portion of the population because at the end, this type of corruption is paid by the poor. This is a tax that is imposed to the poor, and that's the linkage between human rights and corruption. So we believe that this is uh, the new trend in what we are seeing in corruption. And the Lava Jato case, preceded by the Panama Papers that have confirmed, because both of them are linked, is a typical case of grand corruption and the consequences they can generate. The Lava Jato case has impacted in 14 countries of Latin America, three countries of Africa, Mozambique, Angola, and Ghana. And uh, the prosecutors of Brazil steam that it can arrive to a $50 billion uh, amount of, of uh, consequences. So this is a huge case in the region right now. Do you think that uh, 
uh, where are we in this battle in Latin America? Uh, you know, there are a lot of, there seems to have been a awakening among many citizens, uh, less of a tolerance for corruption. Uh, at the same time, there's pushback and there's resistance. And a lot of people are benefiting from the status quo and don't want to change uh, the way things are done. Is what's your kind of evaluation? Does one have to go from country to country, or are there some sort of uh, broad observations that one can make about where where we are right now? Well, Jongi Tongo, one of our heroes in TI for, from TI Kenya, he says corruption always fights back, and that's. Uh, what uh, the academics call re-corruption. After a push against corruption, usually there's a wave against it. And it happened in Peru, for example. We had a very strong and successful anti-corruption process. And now we are dealing again with multiple situations of grand corruption uh, around the country. I would say that for Latin America, the trends are more or less the same. We uh, are, uh, we have historical, structural, and systemic corruption. I mean, this is not episodic. What we are seeing around the region is not that something special happened, but this comes from, back from our history. And uh, it's been proven that it's embedded in the structures, in the way our countries were organized. Extractive countries, as uh, this book of Why Do the States Fail uh, say. Uh, so the trends are more or less the same. And uh, uh, what we are seeing now is this relation between private sector and public sector, all of them involved in uh, a big, huge scheme of corruption. Now, all the, of course, grand corruption and uh, systemic corruption didn't start in Latin America with the Odebrecht case. Uh, this comes far, far be from beyond. But probably this is the first case of multiple jurisdictions uh, involved at the same time with huge impact. I mean, in Peru, we have right now Fujimori convicted for the cases uh, he had in the past, 25 years in prison, former President Dumala and his wife, because they received illegal funding from Odebrecht, $3 million. Uh, former President Toledo, pending extradition from Stanford, uh, he has received $20 million, according to Odebrecht uh, uh, officials. And the current president and former president Garcia probably also uh, will result uh, as members of this investigation. The New York Times some weeks ago asked the question, does Peru need a special prison for presidents? And we are asking if, if that is true. But at the same time, you have the former president of Salvador, Funes ran away. He received 1.5 million for his political campaign. Former president of Panama detained here in Florida, pending extradition to Panama. He and his sons received more than 15 million dollars from the Brazilian companies. Uh, president Santos, probably one of the better presidents performing on the region, had to recognize that his campaign was tainted with 1 million dollars coming from these companies too. Uh, so this is happening all around, and I think these trends need to be uh, achieved and processed. There are many lessons learned coming from the Lava Jato case and the Panama Papers, I would say. Thank you. If you, oh, there we go. Gracias. Let's start from the beginning. Welcome, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your organization is called Transparency International, so you're committed to transparency. Uh, there are two other steps. One is, is, um, is accountability, um, or, or, or two other goals, accountability and prevention. And uh, accountability goes to the heart of the, the justice system. Um, in Brazil, which has been the most prominent case, and obviously the origin of the source of the Lava Jato, Odebrecht, um, you know, there have been, uh, I think, very impressive efforts to plea bargaining uh, tools, uh, follow the money, uh, which have resulted in these, these prosecutions, whether they'll result in, in, in prevention to, to have reforms in the long term, we'll see. Um, why, why do you think that's happened in Brazil and we haven't seen it as much in some of the other uh, countries? Why hasn't there been these kind of tools of, of, of 
Regarding justice systems, we should also have an historical view. Originally, our justice systems were justice for the elite. I mean, all the poor and rural people were not part of the system. Then we had all these uh, military dictatorships around the 60s and the 70s. So justice became a justice of these regimes. And uh, recently, what we have seen is a very corrupt justice administration system failing all around. Uh, probably the best example of that is Guatemala, where a failed justice system required uh, uh, the, the United Nations effort to create the CICIC, the Commission Against Impunity, bring a sort of international attorney general with 50 investigators from abroad to work with the Attorney General of Guatemala to break impunity, and they were successful. So I would say right now we have two types of anti-corruption models around the world, and both of them come from Latin America. We don't only export uh, <laughs> soccer players and corrupt people, but also anti-corruption systems. And the first one I would say is the Peruvian-Brazilian model, and this is when the moral reserve of these systems react. It happened in Peru. We didn't need United Nations bringing people from abroad. Our prosecutors and our judges, young people not tainted with the past, made it possible. And the results are there. More than 2,000 people were investigated. The former president, the former attorney general, the former intelligence service, 14 generals of the armed forces, all of them in prison, convicted, and paying for the corruption practices. And in Brazil, the situation is exactly the same. In a very corrupt environment, suddenly, as they say, there was an alignment of the moon, the stars, and the sun at the same time. And uh, prosecutor, Attorney General Janot, appeared there. And he appointed Delta and Dalaniel. And at the same time, you had Moro, the judge, in front. And these young people, these small teams, were leading with huge, huge powers in Brazil, political power, economical power, the entire establishment. And they are doing it possible. I mean, this is really admirable. And someone asked me yesterday at the ADB, so how, how that, which is the structure, which is the strategy? There was no strategy. It was just good luck. Huh? And it happened also in Peru. The other model is the Guatemalan one, uh, that it's an extreme model because it implies a very intensive interference in the uh, internal dynamics. It implies some uh, withdrawal of sovereignty in order to admit international uh, actors come and, and deal with uh, issues of impunity. But in Guatemala, the CICIC has proven being very successful, so successful that the current president is trying to throw them away. And the former president is in prison, and the vice president in prison, several ministers. They have taken so many people to court now after decades of impunity that jails are not enough. They are opening camps to bring all these corrupt officials to justice. And uh, this example now has been taken by Honduras. The OAS has created a maxi that is also uh, with less power than the CICIC, but the maxi is also now in Honduras dealing with some issues of impunity. And we expect that they will start bringing some results in the short term. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, just a few more questions, and then I'm going to turn to the audience. I have a lot of questions, but I don't want to. I don't want. I really want to open this up. But uh, the summit of the Americas. Uh, we discussed this a little bit when I was in Lima, and uh, next April. Uh, and the theme is the issue is is corruption, democratic governance. Um, you know uh, this issue as as well as anybody. You know the politics of of the region as well as anybody. Uh, what do you think? If there were two or three things that you think could emerge from that that would be helpful uh, in pushing this in a positive direction uh, from that summit, uh, what are some of the what are your thoughts about that that you think are realistic and that would be useful for that summit uh, meeting? There are many challenges uh, in front of this summit. First of all, because the OAS is divided half half, the, the ALBA countries linked to Venezuela, Bolivia. Uh, and some other uh, states are on one side, and on the other side, you have these uh, more liberal countries. So it's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be easy. Uh, of course, it, it's very interesting that uh, the decision has been taken that corruption should be the, the matter of the summit. 
Uh, and I think basically, even though we shouldn't mention it openly, uh, I would say that the topics to be discussed are the lessons learned from the Lava Jato case. And there are different lessons we can take there in different areas. So the content of, of uh, the discussions, I would say, should go around three basic issues. Political financing. These Brazilian companies were funneling money to all the political parties of the region, and uh, money coming from illicit origins without control. Uh, and then all these companies receiving, uh, uh, as a correspondence to this money, the contracts on big projects of infrastructure. So political financing, I think, it's still an issue, a very big and sensitive issue in Latin America. Moreover, if we are a region with a lot of organized crime, money coming from drug trafficking, illegal mining, illegal lodging, etc. Uh, the other topic that is very relevant nowadays has to do with all the systems of acquisition and investment. I mean, in these cases, we have huge infrastructure works uh, that at the beginning, there's one case, for example, at the beginning, the contract was signed for $1,800 million. After the contract was signed, several addendas came in collusive agreements, and at the end, the works finished in $1.6 million. So a uh, billion dollars, I would say. So more than double. And it happened all around because the, the, the scheme repeated from one country to the other. So what happened that a contract came more than double and there were no red flags, no alerts? Where were the controller offices? What was happening with uh, all the systems of of uh, monitoring and auditing, this nothing happened. So I think we need to rethink, the region needs to rethink how to process these big uh, uh, projects of investment and acquisitions uh, in the region, public contracts and, and public bidding. And the third one has to do with the private sector. Uh, uh, we've seen the largest companies of the region, at least in the construction sector, but it, it, this repeats in all the other sectors, in the fisheries and mining or wherever. Big, very big companies being accomplices of practice of corruption. When you ask them why, they say, because it's the only way to do business here. We are victims of extortion. We cannot do anything to confront this. And that is not true. I mean, it's partly true, but it could be changed. So I think we need to get together, and the summit will have a private sector meeting at the site uh, uh, we need to discuss with the private sector how to think a new way of doing business in Latin America without going through corrupt practices. And this is doable, and, and it has happened in many other uh, regions. And we have also some outstanding companies in different parts of Latin America that don't get into dirty deals, and they are successful. And they have managed to go ahead and, and move forward without getting to these things. So I would say these three topics are quite relevant and are lessons that we can learn from the, from the Lava Jato case. Let, let me just follow up briefly on the, on the private sector and the last point, because I mean, you're, you're in communication with private sectors and, and all throughout the region. Um, what do you sense as, you know, is there a shift in attitude? Is there an openness to do business differently? Um, you know, on the one hand, there's an economic cost to corruption, obviously, but there's also an economic cost to, you know, to, to fighting corruption that you see of concern in a lot of private sectors and people say, hey, you know, this, well, in your own country, in Peru, you know, how many, there's been estimates of how much uh, has affected the GDP and, and, you know, in the Odebrecht and, and in Guatemala, people say, well, people... The government's crippled, and so that and so that creates uncertainty, and uncertainty means an investment's not coming in. And so, how, how what do you sense when you talk to private sector people and try to make the case that they really should be engaged and committed to reform? Of course, there are some economical costs and some efforts that need to be done. But for me, basically, it's a cultural issue. Our entrepreneurs have been used to go the easy way. Uh, investment, you put one and you expect to re receive 1,000 in, in six months. And that's not the way business is done all around the world. So there's a cultural issue. And uh, when I saw in Peru during our investigations against Fujimori and Montesinos, because you know everything was taped. That's a unique uh, right. feature of the Peruvian case. Montesinos was taping everybody. When I saw the video where Dionisio Romero, the most powerful uh, entrepreneur of Peru, 
was arriving to an arrangement with Montesinos, I, I understood that this was a cultural issue. If someone could have defeated Montesinos like this, in, hour, in one hour would have been Dionisio Romero. But he preferred to arrive to this arrangement instead of getting together with the other companies and put him out of business. And I think the easy way has been the way most of our companies and, and private sector uh, entrepreneurs have been thinking. Now they are suffering the consequences of that. Uh, the five big CEOs of Brazil, of the biggest companies, OAS, Camargo Correa, Andrade Gutierrez, uh, Odebrecht, and Queiroz Gabao, are in prison. The five of them convicted to 19.5 years, 10 years, etc., making agreements with the, with the prosecutors. And then all the big companies in the rest of the 13 countries, uh, big, very big companies that have been building a reputation for decades, now are at the point that they could be broken. They lost their reputation. A reputation that took decades to be built disappeared in 20 minutes. And they are forbidden to make business in their own countries. So the cost that they are paying because of these corruption agreements is much more higher than the cost uh, uh, that you would have to pay if you decide to move on an integrity way of, of doing business. Mm -hmm. so there's no comparison, I would, I would believe. Let me just, uh, one, final, just uh, one final question, and then I'll open it up. And people, that I see a very uh, jumping out of their seats. Uh, but just uh, very anxious to ask you questions. But let me ask one final one, and then I'll open it up. This is about uh, the United States, the role of the United States, and especially the role of, of the US government in this uh, effort. It was important, certainly, the Odebrecht case, the role of, of the Justice Department. Um, and uh, what do you think, uh, and of course, we're in an environment, you know, with, with an administration in Washington where there have certainly have been lots of questions that have been raised about conflict of interest and other questions as well, which is another piece of this, of the role of the United States, how the, how the United States is now seen in, in this, on this issue. And do you think that it could still play a useful, effective role um, in, in this uh, effort, in this fight to combat uh, corruption and what, how do you see the United States now, you know, especially in this political environment that we're in, and, and given what it's done in the past, is, it, is, it, uh, is there expectation that it continue to play a positive role? And if so, how, how so? What would be some of the things that it could do? We are living in a global world. Corruption is global. And uh, it is not true when some countries say, well, corruption is not our problem. We are quite clean. If you look at the CPI, the Scandinavians, and some other developed countries, even Chile and Uruguay in, in Latin America, it is not true. I mean, we are all involved in this issue. I was recently in New Zealand, for example, and uh, New Zealand has qualified as number one clean country in the CPI 2016. But you dig a little bit, and then you see all the issues of corruption behind reality of New Zealand. They are receiving money from the 1MDB corruption case in Malaysia through uh, dark trusts and offshore companies. The price of property in many places in New Zealand have just boomed because of the Chinese illegal funds coming from corrupt schemes, and the same in Australia. So, Nobody is exempt of this situation. The United States is one of the biggest financial markets in the world. And we have seen, again, in the Lava Jato case, $2.6 billion has been imposed only to Odebrecht because most of the money came through uh, uh, the, the American markets. And there were offices of Odebrecht working from Florida. I think the airport of Florida has been built by Odebrecht. So we are all in, so it is very worrying when you hear candidate Trump before he became a president saying, well, the FCPA, you know, it's, it's, it's not good because it's impeding us to make good business. And when he questions the Dodd-Frank Act or other issues, uh, this is really, really bad for the world because the FCPA, for example, has been an instrument that has helped other countries to clean their environment, so at least to limit the corrupt practices. What we are envisaging is that we are having, we will have soon 
and that's our concern to try to build a TI presence as soon as possible here in the States, that in the short term, we will have to confront some big issues of corruption here uh, related to conflict of interest and other uh, 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 matters that are around the President Trump. So uh, I think uh, the future here will be much more challenging than it is right now. And uh, in the context of grand corruption, we hope the United States will not play a role against uh, this trend of trying to, to fight corruption. We are living in many parts of the world uh, uh, a reality of shadows and lights. On one side, we have big scandals of corruption, but at the same time, you can see all these efforts with no precedent uh, before of systems trying to deal with that. And there is a new element in the, in the scenario, and it is people mobilization. We've never seen, as we've seen three million people in Brazil, uh, for months, thousands of thousands of people in Guatemala demanding uh, President Otto Perez to go to prison, and now he's in prison. And three days ago, again, the people of Guatemala challenging this president that is trying to bring impunity to the system. The same happened in Honduras. 1, 000, uh, 100,000 people in Dominican Republic on the Green March Against Corruption. In South Korea, more than 1 million people brought down the president. In Romania, more than 1.5 million people fighting this draft law to legalize bribe uh, under 10,000 euros. And it's happening in South Africa and, and everywhere. So we believe that this people mobilization is going to make also a difference. But there's a challenge, and it's sustainability. We don't want more Arab Springs that just outburst and then disappear in six months, and then Mubarak and Ben Ali are then uh, coming again. So for us, NGOs and Transparency International in particular, it's a challenge. How can we bring sustainability to these efforts fighting corruption on the field? Great. Thank you. Uh, I always suspected New Zealand there was a problem underneath. <laughs> I'm glad you've confirmed my suspicions. Peter, do you want to uh, start? This is we'll, we'll collect a few questions. Just a couple of, of things. Oh. This is uh, Peter Hakem, by the way, who is uh, a <coughs> former president of the Dialogue and is now a senior fellow here as well. Uh, thank you, Michael. Judge Moro in Brazil recently made a speech that was a very powerful speech where he suggested that the judiciary alone won't have very much of an impact without uh, an alliance or a support of the legislature and the presidency. In other words, that this is you can throw lots of people in jail, but it's not going to change the system unless Congress gets behind this. And the majority <coughs> politicians want to see it. And it seems to me just the contrary is happening in Brazil now. There's a battle between the legislators, the presidency, and the judiciary. And as far as people on the streets, uh, they've gone. They're no more on the streets protesting uh, corruption in Brazil. And so I just wonder, is this, you know, yeah, you can have a short-term sort of uh, lava jato, where you do put a lot of people in jail, do an aggressive judiciary. But how do you get, you know, when the majority of the Congress is probably uh, is under investigation already. The president himself is now good, a lot of good evidence that he's involved. And just a small second question, if I can. That Brazil, if I, for many, many years, was the fourth most transparent country in Latin America. Year after year, it was ranked right behind Uruguay, Chile, and Costa Rica in fourth. Once in a while, it was dropped to fifth. And I just wonder if, you know, I know you measure perceptions of corruption, not actual, but is there something wrong about the surveys of transparency if they left Brazil, which now is the source of corruption in 14 Latin American country, in fourth most honest country in Latin America. Well, you can also ask about Peru. I think Peru was very high in the transparency, right? No, was, no not really. If, under Fujimori, I meant under Fujimori. No, historically, we've, but let me answer first the, the first question. It is true. I mean, I think the Lava Jato case is 
too young to know what is going to happen, and there are a lot of contradictions inside. And Congress and the political parties are playing a terrible, awful uh, uh, game against the anti-corruption efforts. Remember that while the Brazilian people were mourning the killing of their football team that went crashing the, in the airplane, that same day at 3 a.m. in the morning, the congressmen were trying to pass a law <coughs> to prosecute the prosecutors that were fighting against corruption. So that's the attitude of the political class. Uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't be so uh, lack of believer on what people can do. There's a unique experience in Brazil, and it's the experience of the uh, prosecutors. The task force of the Lava Jato case went to the streets. It's the only case in the world I know that <laughs> prosecutors went to the streets to collect signatures in order to back their proposal of legal changes. And some of those started, and then they, they stopped. So yeah, what Moro says is, is quite true. It is too soon to know what is going to happen. Probably Lula will be the next president if his conviction is not confirmed in the next weeks. So we need to know to see what is going to happen. But yes, it's, it's, these processes usually are not straightforward. I mean, they come with contradictions. And probably it's a process that needs will have several accumulated stages before it produces a result. On the CPI, uh, yes, this is our most sexy product, but at the same time, the most questioned one around the world, basically by the governments that don't like it. Uh, and we are very proud of it. And we have tested it several times. And I'm now absolutely happy to read in an article that was publicly presented by Robert Klitgar some weeks ago, when he, where he has compared the CPI with all the other surveys around the world with hard data, some of them. And his conclusion is that the CPA is very consistent. Now, how to understand what, happened with, what happens with Brazil uh, and what happened with Peru or Fujimori? The average of, Latin, of um, the Americas is 44 out of 100. So it's bad. It's bad. If you take the United States and, Ca and Canada from that picture, then Latin America goes down to 33. And if you look at Peru, Peru never has been over 38. Brazil, probably 39, 40, something like that. And Uruguay and Chile that always have been on the top of the rank, yes, of course they have corruption. I mean, probably you will not see a carabinero in Chile asking for money, like you will see most of the uh, uh, police forces on the rest of the countries. But Chile has corruption issues. They had to put in place the Angel Commission to, to address these issues. And Uruguay is, is, a, is a laundry of, of illegal assets. Everybody knows that. So it depends of what is the CPI looking at. So we don't rank the entire integrity of the country, because these are surveys we pick up from different sources, and then we apply our formula. So, what Brazil expresses and Uruguay and Chile and Costa Rica when they feature well in the CPI is not that there's no public corruption. It's very quite extended in Brazil, and this is the example. And Peru of Fujimori, it was a literally state capture from a criminal network. So we need to be cautious when we read the CPI because it is not reflecting the entire environment of corruption in a specific country. Great. Thank you. Sir. Wait for the microphone. Just tell us who you are, if you could. There's a microphone there. Thank you, Alvaro Galindo. Um, my, I have uh, two questions. One in, is referring to best practices. What, what is, uh, from your point of view, um, the best practices that uh, states can uh, take into account for reforms in order to um, try to enforce uh, the legal system uh, in order to fight against corruption? And the second one is in relation to what is happening today with Odebrecht. Um, for example, a few weeks ago, El Comercio in Peru um, mentioned that there is um, a notice of dispute brought by Odebrecht against Peru for the ter termination of some contracts. So it seems that Odebrecht may have a first reaction to cooperate 
uh, with uh, different uh, authorities around the region and in the US as well. But now it's uh, maybe moving more aggressively in order to have some kind of a chilling effect uh, uh, in some states as basically saying, if you are going to interrupt our activities, uh, we're going to react with international claims against you. Yeah, on the first one, uh, there are a lot of proposals in the table of how to deal with corruption from the state. Uh, Klitgar, again, he's an expert in anti-corruption issues, and he says that corruption, he has a formula, that corruption equals monopoly plus, uh, plus discretion of public officials, less accountability. So anything that can help to break monopoly, I mean, different competition of state agencies to provide services, uh, deregulating many of the administrative issues, uh, access to information and freedom of speech, uh, of course, transparency in, in uh, political financing, all of those measures on the preventive side, education, uh, meritocracy, I don't know if that's an English word uh, in, <laughs> for public officials, all of them are, are good measures and good practices in order to prevent corruption. And on the other side, the experts say we have to combat corruption and start frying big fishes. And this has proven to be very efficient in most of the countries where, where this has started. And also breaking impunity routines. There are routines that repeat from one agency to, to others. I mean, the consequences of corruption are not only material, money, uh, hunger, deaths, I mean, when a building collapses in Bangladesh and 1,600 women die, and then we learn that this is because the owner of the building paid a bribe in order to construct the building without technical uh, uh, qualifications, those lives are direct cost of corruption. But there are also other consequences of corruption, and these are unmaterial consequences. Lack of trust and weakness of institutions. And recovering from that is, is very difficult. I can tell you, in my country, 17 years after Fujimori, we still haven't recovered. The judiciary and other agencies are still very weak. But a lot of elements are there. Uh, for your second question, it's a very complex situation. Because you have on one side these big companies and public officials that have committed horrific crimes of corruption. But on the other side, you have these huge infrastructure projects where thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are working and that will have an impact on development on, on the countries. We're talking about 14 countries. And let me tell you that the Peruvian case, only one project, Gasoducto del Sur, the big gas project, had to stop because it was in the hands of Odebrecht, and it will imply two points of the GDP for 2017. That means $2,000 million less getting into our budget this year that at the same time will imply 150,000 Peruvians that are not getting out of poverty in 2017. So there's a direct relation between grand corruption and human rights. The problem is, is the government says, OK, you are corrupt. I will not talk to you. Get out of my country. You stop the project. And then you have a huge social and economical problem. But at the same time, if the government starts talking to the corrupt, then in the political scenario, the opposition and the people start saying, why do you talk to the corrupt? What is under the table? Why are you granting them some flexibility? So it's, it's a very difficult balance. And uh, most of the country have, are not handling it well. In the case, I was just reached by an Odebrecht uh, official three days ago in New York, and he was complaining. I didn't know who this guy was. But then he came to me and said, look, the Peruvian authorities don't want to talk to us. And we are going to take you to the Ciadi arbitration panel. That's not a good option for the Peruvian government. But of course, Odebrecht cannot be so arrogant to try to come to a deal not recognizing all the th bad things they've done. So this balance, I think, is working quite well in Brazil, but it's not working the same uh, uh, in, in other countries. Hmm? And we'll see what happens. Sir, well, let's go in the front row there. Yes. Sergio. The gentleman there. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Alejandro Lara. I'm becoming, a, a quick disclosure, becoming a frequent visitor to the dialogue. 
And it's, there is one specific reason because what I do cut across every single topic what the dialogue handles. It cuts, uh, it talks about, uh, handles uh, uh, about education, um, politics, socioeconomics, and so on. Um, what I do is uh, research uh, coming from the brain, <coughs> brain development, meaning targeting specifically uh, younger populations. Um, I just wondering, to me, uh, corruption, it's, uh, I, I put corruption in, in this, uh, uh, the same as like when someone decides to have a love affair. You know, everything is wonderful until, until it gets caught. That's my view of corruption. Um, so the specific question I have for you, it's do you, do you actually have a program, like, uh, a comprehensive program, that targets the middle fish and the lower fish? Because it seems to me that it's, it, it's targeting mostly the big fish. That's what I'm hearing today. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, what about middle and lower fish? Thank and you. also, um, yeah, that's right. it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is a typical debate if we should target petty corruption or grand corruption. Uh, we are targeting both. Uh, we are a chapter-based organization. We are present in more than 104 countries right now. And most of our chapters on the national level are targeting with, are, are dealing with administrative issues, the policeman on the corner and, and bureaucratic corruption cases. But now as a global organization, we cannot maintain our traditional strategy when we are seeing all these huge cases having so big impact in human rights. So uh, from the, let's say from the global practice, we still deliver many instruments uh, and, and weapons to the world on how to deal with regular corruption or petty corruption. And uh, there's also a lot of educational challenges there. But at the same time, we are adapting our strategy to this, to this new reality. And this is quite new for TI. I mean, this speech on grand corruption was not the speech uh, six years ago. And we are still trying to figure, and uh, every year when we have our annual membership meetings, we try to define how to adjust this strategy to these times. But uh, nobody can deny that grand corruption is one of the biggest challenges now in this type of problematic because of the consequences it has on uh, fundamental rights of people. Sir, in the back, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ignacio Jauregui. Um, I'm uh, from a law firm here called Jauregui Partners. Um, relevant to, to this uh, uh, theme today is we, we have a department and, and sanctions and compliance practice. I wonder, um, and I believe firmly that actually, uh, well, certainly corruption is a big business for some people, but actually anti-corruption is also a good business for people who who are uh, uh, intent and in comply and being compliant. So, my question is, uh, what advice do you give to um, institutions and mainly actually private sector actors uh, throughout the region that actually, you know, they have this fear that it's coming really. You know, I mean, as you say, as you said, uh, the, all these scandals actually have caught a lot of people. But actually, there are plenty more scandals that may be coming up soon, where companies that are in a position where actually they they may be starting to get worried about okay, well, what's it's, it's, it's better for us to come clean now and try to get deals with governments and, and, and not only local governments, but also US and other uh, European authorities, for example. What advice do you give them and how are you working with them in trying to actually get their act together and try to mitigate this as much as they can? Well, uh, first of all, anti-corruption, it's interesting to know that it's, it's a business for some people, for NGOs, it's terrible. We cannot find enough money to do what we want to do. Uh, now, for the business sector, I would say the first thing that is proven now by these big cases is that at the end, corruption does not pay. And uh, it is interesting now because we are having these scandals, most of these big companies are in a very difficult situation, so they are experiencing now what they didn't understand in the past. But at the same time, it's interesting because we have the OECD pushing the criminal liability of companies that we didn't have in the past in most of the countries of the region. So this will change the rules of game of many companies dealing with corruption issues. At the same time, now we have the ISO 37001. It's the anti-corruption ISO. 
And this also is a very uh, valuable tool for companies to uh, start changing their structure and their culture. And the third thing is that compliance is fashion now. I mean, everybody and the lawyers in most of the cases are selling these products of compliance. So companies that will not put in place structures of compliance in the short term, I believe will start uh, 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 being competitive, will stop being competitive compared to other companies that have strong compliance structures. Because now even big companies are requesting their supply chain to comply with several rules. Like it happens with, the, happens with the FCPA up to now. You cannot contract as a supplier with an American company if you don't have several standards according to the law. So I think that this is a trend, and the companies that not get into it will lose market. Thank you. Gustavo, did you have a question? You're not going to talk about Venezuela, are you? No. Sorry? Not Venezuela, right? Not about Venezuela. OK, good. There's no corruption. We don't have them. Do you, uh, do you visualize in the next uh, 10 years or so a supranational organization in Latin America that could face effectively uh, what is now a, a transnational cr criminal organization, which is no longer isolated cases by countries, but but a, 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 a gang of, of bandits. Uh, uh, do we have an effective way, not the OAS, of course, uh, to face this, this situation? Yeah, um, this is a very attractive proposal to have international criminal courts against corruption. My friend, Judge Wolf, has been advocate. I'm going to have dinner with him tomorrow. and. Uh, I told him several years ago, of course, TI supports your initiative, but we will not invest time on that because I think it's not realistic. Uh, I saw the process in order to arrive to the International Criminal Court that deals with crimes against humanity. And not all the states commit crimes against humanity, and it was very difficult to bring all the states to sign the Statute of Rome. So imagine governments that are all of them, or most of them, involved in corruption signing a convention that will then come against them. So I don't think it's feasible, at least in the short term. Our chancellor in Peru uh, just proposed a Latin American court against corruption. I would like to see who will sign that. <laughs> I don't think it's not realistic. Uh, but since it's a global issue, what we've seen now is that there are several instruments that come from the global world that help us in the field fighting corruption to have better results and more efficient practice. But having institutional bodies uh, uh, with the support of the governments, even United Nations, I mean, they are still hesitating uh, how long to maintain the CSIC because it is politically costly for the Secretary General, such a body that is generating uh, so much uh, uh, results in, in, in a specific country. Thank you. Why don't we go up here? My name is Maria Cristina Mendes Caldeira. I was a witness against corruption in Brazil. I am a in the United States because they tried to kill me several times. So what I want to know is that when People from society, normal people, will be able to fight corruption and have someone in their own country backing them up. Because from what I've been through, they basically destroy your life. They use parties as a personal tool to destroy you and shut you up. So I want to know, and maybe that's why the society in Brazil, it's, it's not talking anymore. Because they don't see a way out. So I want to know if there is a light and where it is. Thank you. Well, there, there are no recipes for that. I would say that we have, it is a problem for many whistleblowers. For example, they have been harassed and, and victims of, of different types of attacks, uh, character assassination, campaigns, and, and physical attacks. But at the same time, there are some other processes that have been backed by the people. 
Uh, the Peruvian case is one of those. When uh, harassment came against the agencies that were, that were prosecuting these cases, the people backed it and went to the streets, and they stopped it. And in Brazil, it happened for some time. I don't know what is going to happen in the near future, but Moro would, wouldn't be there, and Dalaniel and his team wouldn't be there if the people wouldn't be supporting them. I mean, the Congress would have overpassed them a long time ago. Uh, and uh, when Ivan Velasquez was going to, bo to be thrown out of, of Guatemala, the people went to the streets, and the, the president had to back. And again, in Romania, when the Congress tried to pass this, the people went to the street and they changed the decision of Congress. So it is not an easy one. People always ask me when I make these type of presentations, which is, how can you trigger people mobilization? We don't know. I mean, this is a very strange thing. In, in, when and how this happens. Social media helps a lot, but it's not only the, the only response. There, there are some elements that we haven't processed just that make a situation that just explodes. But uh, it happens sometimes, sometimes not. Uh, there are many people now saying that in Brazil the people is tired. Uh, it could be. We don't know. Still, the process is ongoing, and we will have some. We don't know what's going to happen if Lula conviction is confirmed, for example, and he will not be able to run for candidate. That could generate uh, a public reaction. Hatia Salazar, who is the director of the Rule of Law, Due Process of Law Foundation. Can you get the uh, microphone, please? Thank you, Katia. Uh, my question is also related to the role of international law and international mechanisms to fight corruption. Um, I agree with you. I mean, I think that uh, thinking in a regional or international court to combat corruption is more than more a wishful thinking than a possibility. But I, I also think that there is a still many things that international systems, international human rights systems, could do in the fight against corruption. CC is one possibility, but uh, this is my first question. What else can we ask or can, can we expect from United Nations mechanisms? And on the other hand, what can we expect or ask or demand from the inter-American human rights system, which is which so far hasn't done much um, uh, directly connected to, to the fight against corruption? Yeah, that's, that's a very good <clears throat> question. We are intensively working on that because of the linkage between human rights and corruption. Now we are challenging some of the agencies dealing with human rights issues. So I already met with Ben Suda, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. We discussed many years ago if it would be feasible to change the Statute of Rome. We arrived to the conclusion that it's not feasible. So now what we are requesting the Prosecutor's Office of the ICC is to consider grand corruption as an admissibility criteria for crimes against humanity and an aggravating factor in the cases where those crimes are going to be sanctioned. Most of the cases of crimes against humanity have components, significant components of grand corruption too. So that's, and, and she received this with, a, with considerable excitement, and we are working together to identify cases that can be trials for this. And this is also a challenge for the academia, universities, and other NGOs. How can we work on these cases and bring this to light? Uh, we've also met with uh, United Nations, high level officials. Uh, we are requesting or exploring the possibility of having. Uh, a special rapporteur on grand corruption under the mandate of the Human Rights uh, High Commissioner. It is not an easy thing because you know all the bureaucracy of UN, but uh, there was also very good reception with the advisors of the Secretary General. We sent the Secretary General a paper that he liked very much. Of course, there are all these political things going around. Corruption is not popular when you try with uh, governments of different nations, but uh, we expect that we can take advantage of the experience of the human rights systems to process corruption issues. Uh, on the inter-American side, we have requested a hearing that we expect to have in October. Uh, we have requested an opinion consultiva. How do you say that in English? I don't know. Uh, consultative opinion on human rights and corruption. And uh, the commission is going to, to hear us, and we expect that we can have that opinion. And with that opinion, we will have a very relevant tool to deal uh, uh, at least within the, the sub-regional system. And finally, we've also been talking to the IMF, 
uh, we met with Madame Lagarde and, the, and her team uh, in order to, to reinforce uh, corruption as an indicator for the policy lending uh, issues. And uh, now we are working together in Ukraine. The IMF has disimbursed uh, or, or committed a huge amount of money to Ukraine, but the Ukrainian president is reluctant to create an anti-corruption subsystem, so this is part of the bargaining now between IMF. So I think there are many doors that we can knock and avenues that we are now experiencing in order to, to open the space for, for the anti-corruption fight. Great, thank you. Um, two questions here, gentlemen. Yes, you had a question, no? Yeah, and then the gentleman next to you. Yes, uh, well, thank you very much for the, um, the conversation. I wanted to talk about uh, impunity. Oh, your name, please. My name is Ignacio Peso. Um, well, I wanted to talk about impunity and, and how this is affecting also our countries. It seems sometimes we step one uh, step forward and two steps backwards. And I wanted to know if you had any comments, for example, um, in the case of Peru, and when many people who follow the political uh, context right now in Peru talk about the possibility of a presidential pardon to Fujimori. No, and what do you think the consequences can be in terms of impunity? Uh, how can you link this to the fight against corruption in, in, in our system? Thank you. To my understanding, uh, the president already took the decision to pardon Fujimori. Uh, we will probably see this in the following weeks once the new uh, um, cabinet uh, takes control of the situation. Uh, and the, the legal situation is clear. I mean, we have a possibility, and it is humanitarian pardon. Peruvian law says that Fujimori or whoever is in that situation can be pardoned in two situations. When he has or she has a terminal disease, and secondly, if this disease is challenging their lives, is attempting to their lives. If there is a medical uh, opinion saying that Fujimori is in that situation, I personally have no problem him going home or to the streets. He's, he's quite old now. Uh, you see that he is in, in not in good shape. So this is not about revenge. This is about justice. This guy has been there for nine years. Of course, the victims have also their position, saying you should not pardon this guy easily because they, he has killed our, our sons, our brothers, our mothers. There, there are a lot of human rights issues there. Uh, if the government takes the decision on legal basis, it would be controversial, but I think it could be sustained. If the government forces the situation for a political decision to talk to the opposition, to send a message to Keiko or to Kenji, that would be much more controversial. And I think it would be more costly outside of Peru than inside of Peru, because international NGOs are observing this, and they are quite sensitive to this type of uh, impunity measure. Thank you. Sir, you have the microphone. Hello, uh, Luis Quirarte from Mexico. Um, well, my first, my first question was regarding the Inter-American System of Human Rights and its role um, combating corruption that has been addressed. The second one would be um, other previous existing mechanisms. Uh, you mentioned UNCAC, but we also have the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption, which follow up mechanism MESIC. Uh, we have the OCDE. Uh, we have the, G the G20 Working Group on, on Corruption, Financial a Action Task Force. We have a plethora of different instruments and, and mechanisms already in place that sometimes seem to work um, separately from one another and duplicate efforts, and states have to report permanently to all of them in, in, in different strands. Uh, what would you say about possibilities of coordination among them to, to yeah, make, it, make them more cost-effective and efficient? What was your fair question? I, I think you already answered that. Yes. Uh, Katia, uh, okay. It was Katia's question. Yeah, it is true. Uh, there's lack of coordination of many of the agencies, each one of them uh, doing their own uh, uh, approach to the issue of corruption without talking to each other. And I think multilateral banks are a good example of that. When the World Bank started debarring uh, corrupt companies, uh, then these companies changed their name and went to the IADB, to the Asian Bank, until they decided to take a joint decision. And now if you are debarred from any of the banks of the system, you are in problems with the entire system. So I think something like that needs to be done. Uh, the ANCAC is still quite new, and it's not really applied by many countries. Uh, for example, for this Lava Jato case, we've proposed from Transparency International to apply Article 47 to promote joint investigations. That's something totally new, 
and has not yet been addressed. Uh, all these 14 uh, attorney general's offices working together to, to try to, to move forward investigations. But yes, uh, at some level, these institutions are talking to each other. I mean, OECD is talking to, to United Nations, the World Bank, NGOs, but still I think there's a lot of space for more uh, tight coordination between, between all of us. I always say that while states and institutions that are fighting corruption are still in this difficult dialogue because of sovereignty, political issues, etc., the corrupt are talking every day. They sit together in the table. They share defense. They decide common strategies. And that's why probably they are a step forward uh, against the agencies that are dealing with them. Thank you. Sir, yes. I'm going to go on this side. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Benjamin Escobar. Um, I think this is a most uh, interesting discussion about the subject. Uh, I would like to bring Venezuela into the into the loop. So, uh, uh, excuse myself for <laughs> for bringing it, but I think it's a, an important issue. And you mentioned Venezuela when you uh, said in your uh, discussion that uh, uh, Venezuela and France uh, are di dividing the OAS in some extent. Uh, uh, you say there are other countries which are more liberal and so on in the issue. And uh, recently in the OAS, there was a special audience about uh, you know, Article 7 of the, the Roman Institute. And uh, I wonder if perhaps you could uh, perhaps make an, some kind of uh, enlightenment about uh, how you are seeing the corruption in Venezuela. Because uh, in this uh, audience, uh, uh, the link between the human rights and, and, and the Rome, uh, Roma Institute uh, is bringing you know into the loop uh, as well in the OAS. Perhaps uh, you can uh, enlarge a bit on that. Thank you. Okay, Venezuela has been ranked the worst country in Latin America in our 2016 CPI. It's almost uh, on top of the failed states, and I think it's absolutely accurate. We have a chapter, very active chapter in Venezuela, act, uh, working in very harsh conditions, and the reports we receive from them are awful. It is not only about drug trafficking, it's about trafficking of food, and there's a totally corrupt structure dealing with these issues, and of course, all the dirty business that an opaque system can provide. I mean, the country with more contracts of Odebrecht is Venezuela, 32 country contracts, compared to two, four, even 12 in Peru, that is one of the highest. 32 contracts in Venezuela. And if the pattern of Odebrecht and the others replied everywhere, why not in Venezuela? And now we have uh, former or current Attorney General Ortega, depends who, who talks about her, saying that she has the proofs that Maduro had these offshore companies moving and laundering money all around, and Diosdado Cabello too, etc. So the problem with Venezuela is that for many years we didn't have information. Now information is leaking. Now we are seeing what's going on. I'm going from here to Caracas on Sunday, so three days after we can talk what I can see, but I assume it's not, it's not a, an easy situation. Thank you. Sir. Wait for the microphone, please. Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Mark Boschetti. I'm a reporter for MLEX. I have a question about the whole Odebrecht case. Um, it's come out, I think, pretty clearly, both in the Brazilian and in the US investigations, that the bribery was very extensive across Latin America. I think you said 14 countries. Um, but many of these countries, when they have gone to Brazil and requested the evidence, apparently have run into problems. I know the Colombians have complained about this. Argentina has complained. Peru has complained. Uh, my question then is, do you believe that Brazil is living up to its obligations for mutual legal assistance under the international agreements that are relevant here? Thank you. Yes, uh, that's a nightmare for us, uh, for us Transparency International. I mean, we are present in most of the 14 countries, and we are trying to do huge efforts working with the prosecutor's offices and with our Brazilian team. Here is Bruno, who is in charge of our Brazilian team. And he's done a tremendous work with the prosecutors and the judges in Brazil. But at the same time, all our chapters are trying to engage 
to facilitate the communication and the exchange of proofs. But it is not the guilt of Brazil in the matter of your question, because uh, Brazil is acting according to the rules and in a reasonable uh, uh, way. If they arrive to an agreement with Marcelo Odebrecht, uh, and Marcelo Odebrecht, who has been convicted to 19.5 years, 19.5 years in prison, and he's expecting to reduce it to eight in exchange of the information he's going to bring to give to the Brazilian authorities. With other 72 officials of Odebrecht that he has brought to this agreement, uh, of course, Marcelo Odebrecht is saying, OK, I will, you provide, I will provide you the information, not only of the crimes that we have committed in Brazil, but in Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, Salvador, et cetera, et cetera, 14. But which is my incentive of giving you the information and you granting immunity to me here in Brazil if once I'm free, I'm going to be pursued by Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, all of them trying to put me in prison and, and, and take money out of me. So Brazil, uh, in order to receive the information, they believe it's valuable, and I think it's totally legitimate for Brazilian interests, is saying, OK, I will grant you immunity, and I won't give I won't handle the information you are giving me to the other countries unless the other countries commit themselves to respect this immunity agreement. And that is happening in some countries, in Peru, for example, now in Panama, uh, uh, Colombia, but it's having problems in other countries. An Argentinian judge two months ago uh, made a ruling saying that Argentina will not grant immunity to the Brazilians because their law does not admit that possibility. I'm not sure if that is true, but we also need to understand that our judges and prosecutors in the region are not used to plea bargaining. This is an Anglo-Saxon institution. And we have to deal with a cultural issue there uh, to, to make these uh, actors, uh, operators, understand that this is not immoral, that this is just about ending impunity with uh, uh, the less cost possible. But yes, this is an issue we are trying to, to address. Yesterday, I had uh, several meetings with the IDB, and probably they will jump in as actors to try to intermediate and see if this is possible. And that would be a great thing if the IADB uh, decides to, to work on this. Mm -hmm. great. Yes, sir. Here in the front row. Uh, Leonardo Semperte is my name. Um, one question. Um, from the private sector perspective, especially from the extractive industries where I know that Transparency International is working for uh, in some projects, how active these companies should be in order to promote transparency from governments? Uh, do you think they should be only hands-off corruption, or do, do they should be promoting and sponsoring several initiatives in the in the issue? Well, extractive industries have proven to be the most uh, uh, sensitive industries for corruption because of the amount of resources they mobilize. And uh, we, of course, are dealing with these issues, but there's the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, which we are part of, and they are the champions of this. So they are dealing with other organizations like Publish What You Pay and others that are looking at this part of the industry of trying to, to engage these companies to be as more, pro as more proactive as possible uh, uh, providing information to civil society and authorities to know what's going on. Now, this is a difficult thing because it's a very technical issue. Many of the countries of EITI are publishing their information, but not in an understandable way for a common human being. So uh, the effort now is how to bring down this uh, uh, transparency of the information of the extractive industry so it can be monitored and audited by uh, citizens and civil society organizations. But this is really a huge challenge uh, right now. Thank you. Yes. Here. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sarah Loopberger. Uh, I had a question about the two models that you mentioned of um, anti-corruption, the one being in Brazil and Peru around the moral response and the one in Guatemala with international intervention. I was wondering if you could talk more about how the inter international intervention model came about and what the actual mechanisms that resulted in it, especially if, as you mentioned, it is an infringement on sovereignty, which is very rare for countries to permit. <laughs> Well, it was possible because the situation of impunity in Guatemala was not sustainable anymore. Guatemala had uh, an impunity situation of more than 95%, meaning that from each 10 cases of big impact, not only of corruption, crimes in general, assassinations, and, and uh, even genocide against uh, peasants, uh, none of those cases arrived to convictions. Uh, so the situation couldn't stand there for any more there was a lot of pressure for, from several embassies, key embassies in Guatemala, the American embassy, the Swedish embassy, some Nor uh, Norwegian, Danish, and some other Europeans. And finally, they brought this to attention to United Nations, and the United Nations started a very difficult dialogue with the Guatemalan authorities that were absolutely reluctant. This process took like six years of discussion, then it was abandoned, then it was retaken again. But after the killing of some congressmen in Guatemala, uh, uh, the environment changed and they realized there was no choice. Uh, because if not, all the sanctions from the international bodies were, were starting to come. So uh, Guatemalan authorities were not happy doing this, but they did it. Now the CICIC has nine years, and uh, the results are extraordinary, not only because they have been able to investigate and, and take to justice some of these cases, but because they've been working with the Attorney General's office with an elite group of Guatemalan prosecutors, and now they have transferred a lot of knowledge and technology that is also um, bringing good results in the local agencies. Sir, back here. Yes. Thank you, wonderful discussion, and I'm very much appreciative of the questions that have gone before me because they helped me shape this one. My name is Mike Lochnane, and I've been involved in fraud and uh, public integrity investigations in the U.S. for 27 years. My question is, hearing all the wonderful oversight issues that are going on, all the, all the rules, all of the agreements in place, it still comes down to capability to do these cases. How do you assess the skill sets of the people that actually build this, not just the collection, but the ability to analyze it? You are a prosecutor, bringing information to you so that you're effectively able to bring a prosecution. One of the biggest hindrances being has been re referenced, the transnational effort, the inability to bring cases over the border or making an agreement in one country having no impact on another. But the bottom line, it comes down to having the information do that prosecution in your country. How strong are the skill sets of the communities that need to do those kinds of investigations, not just to give advice, but to actually build the cases? How do you assess that? Traditionally, it has been a weakness. Uh, most of the agencies dealing with these complex issues uh, were not prepared. Our laws were not prepared. When we started the Fujimori case, our procedural criminal code was from 1940. So it was not prepared to deal with organized crime, but traditional fraud or, or robbery or uh, homicide or whatever. Now we are shaping on, on rules. And still there are a lot of, of a lack of skills, I would say. But when we get into these cases, it's absurd to believe that prosecutors and judges that are trained for criminal issues will be savvy on financial schemes, offshore structures. That is not the way it works. Uh, in the developed work, world, then you bring people that know about that. So uh, multi uh, uh, skill teams are needed, and I think Brazil is a good example of how they are working. They, they have an entire team on IT dealing with all these new uh, uh, intelligence analysis, network analysis, things that were not ever in the universities taught to the prosecutors and the judges, I'm sure. People with financial background, with expertise in corporate issues, working together, bringing advice to the prosecutors and the judges. That is happening. That happened in the Peruvian case, uh, of course, in, in a very much modest way, because at that time, we, we don't even have 
an intelligent an intelligence unit uh, in order to to deal with the banking information now everybody has a financial intelligence unit at that time we didn't so we need we we were we had to bring people from the banking system to work with us but i think uh multi-institutional investigations now are, are a trend. And because there are also significant uh, possibilities of cooperation, there are agencies from here, from the States, the FBI and other agencies cooperating with uh, those uh, prosecutors and judges that have to deal with these big cases in, in other parts of the world. In the Peruvian case, again, we had uh, an entire team of the FBI that was assigned to work with us in the Fujimori case. We also were working with a, a prosecutor of the South District of Florida. So, uh, and the FinCEN here, the Intelligence uh, Financial Unit of the United States, constantly providing us information to, to work with our cases. So, we are also global for some good things, and these are some of them. Jose, well, I think we've, um, we've uh, abused you. I think if we do continue, this could be a human rights violation, so I don't want to uh, I don't want to be vulnerable to that. There, there are a number of other questions. I'm sorry, Master, I'm sorry. There are others over here, but uh, we said we would end at, at, at 1 o'clock, and uh, hopefully you can, you can stay with us and perhaps chat with some of our guests. We have lunch sandwiches outside for everybody, but I think this has been an enormously instructive um, and insightful uh, session. I want to thank you. I know you're very busy for coming by, but I think we all learned a tremendous amount. And we look forward to working with you and Transparency International uh, on this issue. There's a lot of work to be done that I think you've made clear. So the dialogue is ready and eager to work with you. And I want to thank you for coming by. Thank you very much, Michael. I have a flight to take, so I apologize. I cannot stay too much longer. But thank, thank you. For joining.